Now, yesterday, the government launched a new 750 million fund for research and innovation, the first of its kind in our history. Here to tell us more is Fianna Fáil TD and Minister for Higher and Further Education, Research, Innovation and Science, James Lawless. That is a long title That's for long you, time. Minister. Good it's morning. lovely to have you here. Tell us about this new Inspire fund. for re What is it? Yeah, good morning. So, Inspire is a research fund. Uh, it's to give our universities, uh, our students and our researchers, uh, the equipment, the infrastructure, uh, the labs, the laboratories and the libraries that they need to do world-class research. Um, every leading nation invests in research and development. Um, it's how our economy stays competitive. It's how we keep our multinationals and our indigenous enterprises uh, going strong. It's how we invest in society, whether that's climate change, whether it's drug development, um, health treatments, uh, or even traffic modelling around the city. You know, all these solutions, if we give our researchers best-in-class equipment and funding, uh, we've lots of bright people. I really believe talent is our greatest natural asset. Uh, our people are who we need to invest in. So so an investment in our future, investment in our universities uh, and in our students, and it makes us economically competitive uh, and it drives us on as a society. So we've lagged behind uh, traditionally. If we look at other countries like the Nordics, uh, European counterparts, Singapore, Japan, the world's leading economies invest heavily in R&D. Uh, and this is a real vote of confidence in that sector. So it's, it's over five years. It's part of the National Development Plan. Uh, and the idea is to be a real game changer for the idea space, I suppose. Yeah, really. the idea space. Ideas. But, yeah. I mean, like, over five years, and an awful lot of money going into it. But uh, we're getting uh, emails from, pe from people who are in the colleges. And one here, my concern is that universities may get more funding for equipment, but not enough funding for to hire the staff to generate the much-needed research, which will require the further investment in personnel not only the infrastructure. Yeah, so so it, it, if you're giving all this yeah. money, are the personnel going to be there to do the work? Yeah, so it, there's a talent aspect to this as well. So I totally agree with that, uh, listener. Uh, it's about talent and it's about people because, you, as I always say, you can't have a factory and no workers. Mm -hmm. You can't have a laboratory and no scientists. So there is a talent part of this as well. So we already have a lot of leading edge talent as well. We have really ambitious researchers in our facilities. Um, I met them when I was appointed minister earlier this year and they said to me, we're crying out for this kind of equipment. Uh, this will allow us to compete on the world stage. But, what, but is the 750 uh, million euro fund just for equipment and the labs or is there money going towards hiring people to staff them? So we already have a lot of people staffing them already. So we have a... a but you would probably need more if you're putting all this money in. Well, we, we need to get... So at the moment, all our labs have ageing equipment. It's becoming obsolete. I think 80% uh, of it will age out in the next five to ten years. So there's no point having the best people already on the payroll, uh, already in the universities... Working with old equipment. With old equipment. OK. Uh, and also for students coming through, uh, the most exciting way for a student to be energised is seeing their professor uh, doing research, having the opportunity to collaborate with that, go back to do a postgraduate or even to their undergraduate. So it, it spills over to teaching as well because uh, the teaching quality has improved if they've access to that kind of kit. Um, but it's things like, uh, as a laboratory, it's also things like a supercomputer. We know that digital AI, quantum computing is the future. It's where things are at. So we don't have a national supercomputer at the moment. Uh, a biobank is where you keep your samples. If you're doing life sciences, drug development, pharmaceuticals, you need to have all these little bits of yeah. tissue and cells But it and will be else. staffed. This will be oh, staffed. 100% staffed. Of it will uh, be absolutely. Staffed. And there's a, there is additionally a talent piece in this uh, to staff up the, the, um, the research centres. But I would stress there's already significant thousands of people working in this sector. There's actually, I think, 40,000 people working in research in, in nationally already. Mm. And also there's an industry collaboration piece here. So if you have a really good idea, uh, if you're in business, uh, go and talk to your lo local university, see can you partner on this, can you pair up together, can you maybe have the researchers mm. take it forward, then you can commercialise it back in the company. So it's good for business, good for homegrown business as well. As well as about keeping... somebody who's not in a university but has a really good idea about that, but they're like maybe attached slightly to it. Can they get involved then? So I suppose it's up to the universities to come forward with the ideas. Uh, there's a competitive process, so it's not just uh, a slush fund. You know, it, it'll yeah. be a competitive call. We'll have an international panel doing peer reviews. So you have an idea in, say, life sciences. There'll yeah. be uh, three academics from around the world on a, on a peer review panel. And they look at two things excellence and impact. So excellence, is this really leading edge science? Is this a project that's going to really move the dial? Mm. And then impact, what will this translate into? Is it societal benefit? Is it economic growth? What are the knock-ons from it? Um, and, and if it ticks those boxes, 100% it gets funded. Um, you mentioned there are students coming through and we do know mm. that investing in research is, in, is very important. We can see what yeah. pharmaceuticals and Manjaro has done to our, our GDP and, and GMP. But over the next 10 years, we're going to need more than 115,000 beds for students in our university. Yeah. Currently, there are only 40 
7,000. We've heard about students that are commuting two and three hours every single yeah. day. One that was flying from Donegal to Dublin to try to go to their classes. Mm. So it's great putting in 750 million mm. to have all this great mm. um, equipment. What if we've got no one to actually yeah, go so to university? Yeah, so look, I suppose there's, there's a 200 billion euro fund overall in the National Development Fund. So 750 million, I suppose, is a fraction of, of the wider uh, picture that's there in terms of capital spending. But a couple of things on the student accommodation. First of all, thanking the student from Donegal. Uh, I don't know obviously what course they're in, but just to say, I was up in ATU last week on Monday, uh, which is the college in Donegal, Galway Sligo. That's the university now. That is how, so I opened the vet school on Monday uh, just there. Um, we're investing in regional universities, so the technological universities. So that gives an option to students. They don't have to commute to Dublin or to Cork or Limerick anymore. They don't, but, but we they know do. that some courses are there. And the, also university is yeah. an experience. It's, it's creating rounded human sure. beings. Sure. And I think for an awful lot of us, we had this university experience and now we've got these kids who are sleeping, they're living at home with their parents, Absolutely. they're, they're, so they're, they're travelling yeah, yeah. two they're and three years. Yeah. Like it is happening No, no totally, totally. Uh, my own daughter was in UCD and, and commuting up until just the, this year, she's just, she just graduated. So I, I totally get that. Um, but I suppose the students have said to us, and a number of them said it to me on Monday, we're delighted that there's a vet school now in Donegal because now we don't have to go to Dublin by plane or by car or by train or whatever. Um, however, we need uh, additional beds in the system. So I was student accommodation strategy that, that I'm working on. Uh, it's nearly there. It's in draft. It's gone before the Cabinet Subcommittee uh, which has all the technical parts to get it signed off. Uh, I'll be publishing that by the end of the year. And what we're doing is we're looking at sites all around the country, uh, in, the, in the capital, in the regions, in the technological universities, and we're tackling... Uh, so there's 15,000 student beds have planning permission but haven't even got started. So we're saying, well, why is that exactly? Yeah. So it's viability, it's planning bottlenecks, um, it's things like the the even the the VAT on apartment building. So just last night, I was we were in the dawn until until the early hours, put into the finance bill. There's a measure in that uh, to tackle affordability in terms of the the VAT on on, on uh, student accommodation. So we're doing lots of different, we're pulling lots of different levers, but ultimately we want to make it easier, faster, and more efficient to build student accommodation. Because why are the fifteen thousand beds pl planning not built? That's one of the reasons. And on top of that, we need another 41,000 beds uh, to go into the system. But we also have things like digs. So we've increased the digs beds by 1,000 uh, just recently. And then in terms of the grants, so people sleeping in cars, they shouldn't be in that situation. I get that some people are. So I increased all four maintenance grants uh, in the budget just gone. So those grants are increasing but to give a contribution to people who have to travel further uh, to go to college. You're, you're saying all this, and you're saying all this, and you're going, mm. when, will that, when will that actually be seen? When will students see these beds? Yeah, so I'm, I'm the minister since February, January 27th. Oh, I know. No, um, but like you've had ministers in the, no, it's your government that have uh, no, created no, these problems. Totally, but I suppose, you know, so I, I'm, I'm saying all these things and I'm doing all these things. So, you know, I said I was going to deliver a research programme. It's done yesterday. Uh, I said I was going to deliver a vet school in Donegal. Done, Monday. Um, I said I was going to uh, Queen's and, and uh, Dundalk. So when will they uh, see uh, these beds? So the student beds, uh, so the strategy is coming in for the new year. Um, the... Uh, that work can start immediately and rolling those out then uh, and getting the sites activated. So I'm already talking to most of the colleges. Uh, we already have as well as a lot of beds in the system. Coming. So I turned the site on UCD just last month on 493 new beds. I opened 116 new beds in Maynooth and I expect Trinity uh, to turn the site very We're soon on another 400 odd beds. So that's just three coming through. But we have multiple others. But I would say the digs is a popular option for many. Uh, and also the, the reason I increased those grants is because they were what we call non-adjacents, that people have to travel to college. Because I get that that costs more uh, yeah, to do that. But I would say as well, investing in the regions, and I know people, you know, depending on the course, they want to have the student experience. But a lot of students do say to us and their families, I really want to have an option closer to home. And we're doing that. You know, things like tertiary degrees where you can start closer to home. I know you had carers on, you know. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we actually do carers. have two yeah. young carers yeah. on yeah. later on who had to give up their jobs in yeah. order to care for a loved one. They're unable to attend college because of lack of support. These are young people, they're going to be on at 8.15. They cannot go to college mm, mm. because of the lives that they live, yep. the supports that they don't have. We have so many young carers in Ireland who are saving the government a huge amount of money and they're trapped in this cycle of not being able to move on to further education because they're, they're caring for loved ones. It's an amazing thing that they have to do. Have we failed yeah. a no, whole so, cohort of people? <clears throat> they're young people who are caring from an incredibly young yeah. age so, when they're in secondary school. So I'm very mindful um, of, of people in that situation. Um, we're trying to make the pathways through college as flexible as possible. So the old days when you had to go up to 
you know, with the big city and spent four years there, and that was sort of your, your college experience. There's many more ways to do that now. So particularly people that carers, people with responsibilities at home, people maybe part-time jobs, people that have other things going on, that means they can't do that full-time four-year commitment. So with things like uh, tertiary courses, you do you go to a local uh, ETB college usually. Uh, you mentioned that, but they don't have the time. Do you know what I mean? There's, the supports aren't there. The, the carers' allowance isn't there. There's not enough money so for the them to So the carers' allowance is home. a disregard on the uh, grant application, so the grant application doesn't, doesn't count that. That's disregarded. Uh, we also have part-time fee schemes. I wrote that th this year, one of the things that I've done, uh, since I came into the ministry, part-time courses are now covered for fees. Traditionally, they weren't. So we're paying their fees, we're giving them grants, uh, and we're allowing flexible pathways to help people get through. Okay. And I get that it's yeah. tough. I get that I've cares yeah. on my own family. Um, yeah. But I suppose we're trying to make it as flexible as possible. To get away from the old Monday to Friday for four years in the big city, mm -hmm. we're saying you can do it close to home, you can start year one, two, go on up. You can even do some of it hybrid yeah. online. Uh, or you can take a, an evening course, so we think something called microcreds. You take a couple of courses and you stack them together and get one qualification well, at the end of it. We'll, we'll ask them later um, on. Yeah. You've, uh, there's lots of things that we wanted to talk to you about mm, today, yeah. but we're going to have to uh, move on to something very finally. Of course, there's still this review into the presidential yeah. election, the selection yeah. of Jim Gavin as your candidate. And obviously, Micheál Martin has come under an awful lot of fire for this and what's happened in relation to this. Um, you've said recently that you'd like to become party leader at some stage. Um, how does, There's a lot of people kind of coming out of the woodwork talking about it right now, going, I would like to be party leader. How does that feel when you're going into work talking about taking a job when someone's currently in the job? Well, Micheál well, Martin is there. Well, I, first of all, I completely agree. Uh, we have, there is no vacancy. We have a really strong leader right now, uh, the Taoiseach. Um, he's doing a great job. But people coming out saying that they'd like to be party leader, does that feel like you've, like it, does it give to the public sort so of a sense that you don't have? So I, 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 sorry, I think the public want people to have ambition. People in politics yeah. that, that you should have uh, leadership. And leadership is many things. Being a cabinet minister is absolutely a leadership position. I lead a department. Um, I lead the, the higher and further education sector. You know, all my colleagues across different departments are in the same boat. We're all leading out in different areas of, of, of the nation. Uh, and that's really important. Um, as but it was the, a fiasco. Are you confident in it? Look, the, 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 the presidential election was a bit of a mess. No doubt about it. Now, look, I put my hands up. I thought that our candidate would be uh, would be stronger, to be honest. Uh, and I, the man, you know, fell aside, unfortunately, during the campaign. And look, we all saw what happened. Mm. Um, and I suppose it's a lesson for... And, and one thing I'd say from it all, the presidential election is unique. And it's not necessarily an election for politicians anymore. Mm. I think actually it's, it's about the values. Uh, it's about an ambassadorial role. It's not an executive role. You know, it's not to be a teacher. It's not to be a cabinet minister. And maybe the political parties, in a way, need to let it go and say, actually, this is a contest for an individual to come forward and speak to the nation in terms of values, like Michael D did you know, for 14 years, like President Condi, I'm sure, will do now. And maybe it's not, you know, we are good at many things. We're, you know, I'd like to think we're good at running the country. We're good on councils, good in the Senate, as political parties. And Fianna Fáil actually has won all those elections, general election, Senate election, council I know, election. you're giving a lovely oh, speech okay. now. So, that's, you know, that's what we need, speeches we, we, we from people who want to be leaders. But, you know. uh, we'll have to leave it there. Uh, Fianna Fáil Minister for Further and Higher Education, James Lawless, thank you so much so, for joining us this morning, Minister. We appreciate it.